All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know we may have some folks still trickling into the room. Uh, for those of you that have been following along with our faculty lecture series so far this quarter, welcome back, excited to have you. Uh, my name is Jane Remel. I work in the Office of Admissions and I'm here to help on the back end uh, with tonight's lecture. Very quickly, I do wanna just give you a little bit of a lay of the land here. You're probably all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but just to remind you, there is a chat feature and we have opened that up. So as we move through the talk, if you have questions, I encourage encourage you to use the chat to submit those. There is also a Q&A and you are welcome to use that option. I'll keep my eye on both of those. But again, this is really a great opportunity to ask questions and talk with faculty. So I encourage you to use those uh, uh, tools. Now, without further ado, tonight we are joined by Professor McRae from our Department of History, who is going to be leading us through tonight's session. So without further ado, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. The virtual floor is all yours. Okay, let me see if I can switch things over here. All right, well, hopefully that's working for you all. Uh, thanks very much. It was a real treat to be invited to do this this evening here in um, Santa Barbara. Uh, the talk that I have for you today is a sort of distillation and synthesis of a bunch of different ideas about the nature of technology and innovation and history. And a lot of these ideas come from classes that I teach here at UCSB in the Department of History. So I'm going to start with a simple claim. How we think about technology and innovation is too often too narrow. It oftentimes um, also presents us with something that we, I think, should be concerned about. So if you go into Google Images and you say, hey, Google Images, what does innovation look like? Your results will probably be something pretty similar to what I'm showing here. You'll probably see light bulbs, lots of light bulbs. And light bulbs, of course, used to be symbols of inventive insight. Think about people like Thomas Edison. Ignore the fact that Edison was just one of several inventors who made the light bulb, uh, which apparently, according to Google Images, is the standard issue icon for innovation. Or ignore the fact that Edison never really worked alone, but OK. But maybe your quest to see innovation will also perhaps produce some pictures of people. Almost all of them will be men, and they will probably be looking thoughtful, staring out the window, maybe looking at chalkboards or something like that. So anyway, in this picture that we get, innovation or technological change and the pursuit of novelty is oftentimes presented to us as clean and orderly and unfettered by and disconnected from the messy material world, and it's even messier history. And I say messy because this rather antiseptic view of innovation hides the reality of technological change. Revolutions, whether they are technological or political, are messy things. They are disruptive in all senses. The colonization, the child labor, the slavery that helped power the first industrial revolution created centuries of social disorder that we still are grappling with today. The upending of old economies and old industries left environmental footprints that still affect us. And of course, industrial revolutions, when they arrived, what they brought and what they swept away look really different depending on whether you're seeing them from Europe or North America or Asia or Africa. But regardless of place or time, economists and historians often view industrial revolutions through the lens of innovation. Think of this as standing really close to a tree. From close up, you get one detailed perspective, but you lose sight of the larger forest. And once we leave innovation's shadow, stepping away from the tree, in other words, we can get some new insights into the nature of technological change. And this evening, I wanna talk about a few of these ideas. So I'm gonna start by saying that not only is our picture of what innovation is um, kind of wrong, but also we have a distorted view of who's doing all of this innovating. So this is one of my favorite images from the history of technology. Here we've got two people in Kansas during the early years of the Great Depression. These are two people who did something unconventional with their car. 
with the rear tire removed and a drive belt added, they built in essence a car powered washing machine. They innovated. Or if I were a speaker at a TED talk, I might say something like they hacked the automobile. Stories like this help us recapture the richness of technology's history that often is missing. And it also reveals a much more diverse picture. People previously unseen or ignored come into view as participants involved in the innovation process. And this helps us show us that innovation doesn't just involve the people who make the technology. Sometimes innovation happens while it's being used. So just two more examples. In the 1880s, the insurance executive turned entrepreneur George Eastman owned a company that made photographic film. I realize some of you might maybe never have encountered photographic film in your lives. But anyway, his company Kodak invented new types of film that were easier to use and develop, but Eastman's company, the sales um, of these products still was stagnant. So he had this insight. He decided that there was a whole untapped community of people who wanted to try photography, but found the whole activity with its chemicals and dark rooms and all that sort of stuff too intimidating. So in 1888, Eastman's company introduced the Kodak camera with the slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. So for $25, which was a large sum of money at the time, you could buy a camera that came preloaded with film. And when you were done, users simply sent the whole camera back to Kodak. The film was removed, processed, the developed pictures along with the camera were then uh, sent back. The camera was reloaded with fresh film and the whole thing then was sent back to the user. So more than inventing a new camera, Eastman's company invented a new community of users, amateur photographers. And this synergy in turn helps spur further innovation in photography. Or if you want a more recent example, consider the development of the personal computer. One of the reasons why the computer seemed to burst on the scene so rapidly in the 1970s was that computer professionals misunderstood it. Scientists and business leaders were familiar with giant mainframe computers that were built and programmed to carry out mathematical operations. But in the 1970s, small companies began to introduce machines like that shown here. Now these were pity pitifully weak machines compared to something like a giant IBM mainframe, but computer hobbyists could purchase these things, write their own programs and come up with applications and things to do with them that larger companies didn't seem um, that important. So in many ways, we can think of this personal computer revolution as having its origins at the grassroots level. Now, the electronics world has a long history of user-led innovation. In the early 20th century, amateur radio operators uh, pushed the boundaries of long distance communication. And it was business and military interests that followed the path that these hobbyists first blazed. And you see a similar pattern in the 1970s. Computer hobbyists envisioned a much different kind of computing machine. Personal computers that functioned less as scientific instruments and more as everyday appliances. Now, at first, these were simply custom built machines, but soon commercial products like the Apple II in 1977 or the Microsoft operating system hit the market. But the key point was that these were applications developed for and by users. Now, this idea of users as innovators runs counter to traditional narratives of how technological change happens. So a few years ago, the author Walter Isaacson published this big best-selling book called The Innovators. And in it, he tells this compelling story about geeky genius entrepreneurs and the collaborations that they formed and their revolutionary ideas for social media and computers. But if you spend too much time thinking about innovation, you lose sight of what most scientists and engineers actually did and what they still do. Most scientists, most engineers today work to make incremental improvements. They maintain and improve on existing systems. So imagine a different book, one that hasn't been written yet, and let's give it a different title. Instead, let's call it The Maintainers. And we'll give it the subtitle of how a group of engineers, technicians, and bureaucrats built infrastructures that work most of the time. This hypothetical book would reveal the activities essential for sustaining industrial revolutions. This imaginary book would shift our gaze from places like Manchester, England, or Silicon Valley to help us see a wider global infrastructure. This book would be more about continuity than disruption. 
It would tell stories about repair and reuse and sometimes the rejection of innovation. Inventive people previously on the margins that we don't hear about would come into view. So again, if we think about innovation as something that involves more than just making a cool new thing, you start to get a different picture. You start to see that innovation is just one part of all the different activities that make up this thing called technology. So let's assume now that innovation is not the same thing as technology. Where does this take us? Every year here at UCSB, I teach a course on the history of technology. And at the start of the term, I oftentimes ask the students to finish the sentence, technology is dot, 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 question mark. The responses are often predictable. To the average 20 year old, no offense, technology means the sorts of stuff shown here, cars and computers, and of course, smartphones. Hopefully by the end of the term, when I ask the question again, the results will be different. As they have come to understand it, technology involves much more than just things. So here's one example. In the 19th century, engineers and entrepreneurs built vast complex systems for transportation and communication. These systems were both sophisticated and messy. Now to make something like what's shown here function properly, this demanded order and regularity. This meant adopting standards, largely ignored and often invisible, standards create stability in technological systems. They're just not terribly sexy. Whether it's screws or shipping containers, technical standards help transform the novel into the mundane and they help make the local into the global. Now making standards wasn't about making new things per se, but rather it was about making consensus via discussion and debate. As hidden and as unsexy as they might seem, standards are essential to the functioning of our technological world. And they also carry certain ideas with them. For the internet, for example, which is built on a whole array of technical standards, in the United States, when these were created, there was an aspiration for openness, open systems, open source, open access, and the desire that information could move about easily. As a result, these technical standards, which are intangible things that allow my laptop and your iPhone to seamlessly, more or less, connect us to networks as we move around the planet, requires organizations like, for example, the International Organization of Standardization. You flip over your back of your phone, you'll see something in there about ISO. ISO standards created by this global body that most of you haven't ever heard of or thought about help make these technological systems work. Now, techno-libertarians may claim that I made it, but the reality is that without international standards, whatever it is wouldn't work very well. Now, mentioning standards, of course, sparks images of standardized parts. This was an essential feature of the second industrial revolution, like Henry Ford and Model Ts and assembly lines. But Fordism and the factory system didn't make just standardized parts. They also tried to create standardized people. So here we see Ford workers, recent immigrants to the United States after graduating from the company's school to be good Ford workers and to earn the highest wages the company might offer, workers had to learn unfamiliar things like the English language and the demands of a new corporate culture. Like the Model Ts that they built, workers also became alike and in the eyes of some critics, interchangeable. In a book written in 1925, the British polymath Alfred North Whitehead said that the greatest invention of the 19th century was the invention of the method of invention. What he meant by this was the rise of invention based on new discoveries in chemistry and physics at labs and universities in Germany and the United Kingdom and the United States. A critical part of this innovation system was the widespread hiring of professional scientists and engineers. This required a different kind of standardization, professional credentials, of the sort that you are hoping to acquire during your time at UCSB, along with shared research practices, help foster the rise of corporate research laboratories throughout the 20th century. And we can take this idea even further. Think about the standard numbers that define people as they go through life, from school test scores to IQ measurements to credit reports. We are all in some degree the product of standardizing 
processes and algorithms. So although technology is not just things, there is no denying its material basis. But I'd like to argue that sometimes when it comes to things, the ways in which technology is presented to us as citizens and consumers is misleading. Now, for me, one of the greatest offenders is cloud computing. This is a form of computing that uses networks of remote servers connected by the internet to store and manage and process data. And if you read articles about cloud computing, it's usually depicted in this nebulous, cloudy sort of way where machines and people are magically connected. And unlike traditional industry and the infrastructures that support it, cloud computing is presented as something that is frictionless with no cost to the environment. But this obscures its underlying physical reality because in reality, what I'm showing you here, this is the cloud. Yes, it's convenient. Yes, every time I access a file on Dropbox, I use it. But the global demand for these digital data centers uses huge amounts of electricity. Google and Amazon data centers alone account for a notable fraction of the annual electricity consumption in the United States. And you could tell a similar story about emerging blockchain technology, like the mining of real gold, making a single Bitcoin takes energy and labor. It may be virtual, but making a Bitcoin has a cost. For example, a year of Bitcoin trading and transactions requires energy, oftentimes from coal or natural gas, comparable to what the country of Ireland consumes in an entire year. So put another way, our images and our metaphors for speaking about technology matter a great deal. Now, my own family is from Western Pennsylvania. My father grew up near a town called Titusville, which was famous in the 1860s because this is where oil was first discovered um, in North America. And my grandfather was a farmer who had a few oil wells on the family property. Now recall what I said earlier, industrial revolutions are messy things, and this means they are also environmentally messy. So this is an image of the landscape around um, the farm where my father uh, grew up on. Now the environmental effects of the first and second industrial revolutions, the ones that are driven by steam and oil and electricity, go beyond the shattered landscapes that we see in images like this. And we are still very much experiencing these effects as we grapple today, of course, with the impact of climate change. Happy side note, it no longer looks like this in Western Pennsylvania. This area has been turned into a state park, the trees have grown back, the streams no longer run with crude oil, um, and it's actually quite a scenic and bucolic sort of place. So I mentioned this legacy of environmental costs because I think that the effects of this ongoing third industrial revolution, the one that we are in the midst of based on computers and networks and the flows and floods of digital information are far less visible to us here in the United States. Now in the 16th century, Bolivia was famous for its silver mines, which provided a vast treasure of wealth that helped power the Spanish empire. Today, Bolivia is one of the world's largest suppliers of lithium carbonate. This is the central component of the high-tech batteries found in hybrid cars and smartphones. Each Tesla car that we see out in the road has about 140 pounds of lithium carbonate in it. We might think of Bolivia as the Saudi Arabia of lithium. Now, while the environmental effects of lithium production are relatively benign, the same can't be said for minerals like cobalt that are essential to making modern electrical vehicles and modern electronics. The major supplies for minerals like cobalt are in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo and demand for these minerals helps fuel regional conflicts. My point is that even though we might think of our digital technologies as clean and benign and somehow even lacking in materiality, they are very tightly bound to the world of stuff. Their thinginess encourages us to consider questions of health and safety and human rights and the environment. Because in almost all of these pictures of server farms and cloud computing, one thing is conspicuously absent, workers. What we think of past industrial revolutions, we oftentimes have iconic images like this. Images that remind us that industrial revolutions relied on the combined labor of millions of people, many of them laboring in less than desirable conditions, many indeed laboring as slaves. 
But when we get to this most recent industrial revolution, a lot of this labor seems to vanish, or at least it shifts to other places where we, as consumers of things like smartphones and computers, don't see it. So for example, every hour, every day, there are teams of people in places like Manila in the Philippines doing what is called commercial content moderation, simply a fancy word for removing offensive material from social media sites. In other words, making sure that your grandmother doesn't blush when she logs onto Facebook or Instagram. Current estimates are something like 100,000 people employed as contractors by these social media companies to make sure that X-rated and violent material doesn't um, show up with regular uh, frequency on sites like Facebook. This work deals with the ephemeral. Similar invisible work exists for actual stuff, two examples shown here. On one hand, we have workers, mostly female, assembling high-tech products in China. On the other end of the supply chain, we have children working in dumps of electronic waste. The image here is a site in Ghana where something like 50 tons of illegal electronic waste is dumped annually and recycled. While some of it's recycled, the rest goes into primitive landfills where the lead, the dioxin, and the other materials contaminate, contaminate the local water supply. And this doesn't just happen overseas. The environmental impact of computing and information technologies is a problem for us here in California. This is a map of Silicon Valley located in Santa Clara County. It has the dubious distinction of having the highest concentration of Superfund sites in the United States. These are sites judged by the federal government and the Environmental Protection Agency to be in need of immediate remediation. So in this small piece of land, just 10 miles by 40 miles strip of land we call Silicon Valley, there are close to 30 Superfund sites, many of them contaminated by the waste byproducts resulting from the making of semiconductors for Cold War aerospace and defense systems. We might use metaphors like the cloud and think of our information technologies as green and clean, but the reality is often quite different. Now, when I teach my undergraduates about the history of technology, one of the points I really try hard to impress on them is that things, technologies have politics. This might seem an odd concept at first. I don't mean that your cell phone voted for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, but instead what I mean is that the design of things, the basis of our material world reflects people's beliefs and assumptions. An example here shown on the left, these are the bridges and overpasses that one encounters as you drive away from New York City eastward out to Long Island. In the mid 20th century, a man by the name of Robert Moses, who is New York City's powerful urban planner, wanted to make sure that the urban poor, the residents of New York City, couldn't take buses out to the beaches of Long Island that he liked so much. Moses's solution, as the story goes, was to make the overpasses low enough such that buses and trucks couldn't use those roads. The design of those bridges, in other words, reflected Moses's own prejudices. More recently, we have examples like that shown on the right, an example of what we might call hostile design. This is a design of a city bench that does not allow skateboarders to do tricks on it. It has an anti-paint coating to thwart graffiti taggers, and for high crime areas, it has recessed spaces where you can tuck away a bag. And of course, you can't sleep on it very well. This isn't a failed design. In fact, it's quite successful. It's just that the goals of the designer might not be appreciated by the tired, the homeless, or the advocate for the homeless. Does this sort of design solve social problems or does it simply push those problems literally down the street? Now, this fusion of design and politics extends into the digital world. Google, as you all know, employs search algorithms, but those algorithms are written by real people. And as such, they contain biases, conscious or not, that real people have. So at various times, internet searches might yield some curious and often offensive results. This is an image that I grabbed a couple years ago. If you search our uh, women, it doesn't fill in quite this way because Google has tweaked the algorithm so it doesn't ask for number one question, are women evil? Obviously, though, these, these parameters are set by people. And this goes, of course, beyond looking at just stuff on Google. We've all heard how Facebook and Twitter and now TikTok and Snapchat create information bubbles 
where people continue to see feeds of information that strengthen their existing biases. Even more disturbing is the use of computer algorithms by legal systems that predict whether or not criminal defendants are more or less likely to commit crimes in the future and therefore help determine what a person's bail is going to be. Often skewed by race, gender, and ethnicity, these again are an example of um, biases literally built into the digital fabric that many of us um, might experience on a daily basis. So now that I've convinced you hopefully that technology involves tangibles as well as intangibles, this leads to my next observation. Technologies stack. Their physical presence settles like sediment on top of one another. Over time, technologies form layers that a geologist might envision and that a historian can try to understand. So look at this painting. This is from 1872 by a painter named John Gast called American Progress. Here we see Liberty gliding forth across the North American continent, settlers following in her wake, natives and nature scatter before her. In one hand, she holds a telegraph cable and she unspools it along the tracks of an advancing railway. We might see this on one hand as a portrait of American manifest destiny. Seen another way, it's a very vivid example of how interdependent this era's transportation and communication systems were. Here's another way of picturing this. This is a map of, of an American railroad system around 1900. Jump ahead 100 years, and this is a map of the internet. What's interesting is that today's information highways sit on top of old railway and telegraph routes. Geography shapes technology and vice versa. And if we were to take this map and then put another layer on it, um, say for example, 20th century airmail routes or today's electrical grid, we would see a near perfect fit. And of course, the same energy sources that powered old trains and telegraph systems still drive today's internet. As they layer and stack, technologies persist over time. But technologies also coexist with one another in really fascinating ways. My colleague from the history department, Kate McDonald, shared this image with me. It's a picture from 19th century Japan that shows a world where steam and sail and railroads and rickshaws are all sharing common space. Industrial revolutions were distributed unequally in space and time. In other words, the technological world wasn't flat. And today, of course, we are still living in this lumpy, bumpy world as technologies accumulate on top of each other. Now, historians' prevailing emphasis on the shock of the new, on innovation, can create a bit of a smokescreen. For example, it's sometimes common to hear someone claim that the 19th century telegraph was like today's internet because it allowed for the near instantaneous transmission of information. Except that this isn't true. Sending telegrams in the 19th century was really expensive. It was something most people couldn't afford. However, what was innovative for the majority of people was cheap postage. So during the heyday of the so-called Victorian internet, it was trans-oceanic postal systems that made communication cheap and reliable and fast. This allowed for the flow of information to become more widespread and democratic, one could argue. And it's hard to imagine today, but at the time, bureaucrats and business leaders alike spoke about cheap postage in terms that resemble the sort of uh, near religious uh, attachment that people give to many emerging communication technologies today. But this story oftentimes gets lost in the shadow of the telegraph. So again, as we leave, as we escape the pool that novelty and innovation have on our attention, we can start to see some of these hidden histories. My final observation takes us back to Silicon Valley. Now, when we think of it and we think of world-class schools like Stanford or Berkeley, we are conditioned to imagine researchers in computer science and biotech and artificial intelligence all kind of circulating around the ecosystem that is Silicon Valley. But innovation comes from weird places and it happens in ways that are very, very hard to predict. So at Stanford in 1960, there was an experimental music composer by the name of John Chowning. 
1968, Chowning, who liked to experiment with um, uh, electronic music, discovered something called frequency modulation sound synthesis. Working with his music department, Chowning went on to get grants from both the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts to work on this way of making electronic music. This is an important fact because it helps highlight the role of the federal government in fostering innovation. Another fact that oftentimes gets lost whenever we talk about innovation. But then in the mid 1970s, the Japanese electronic company by the name of Yamaha licensed Chowning's technology. The company then went on to release a whole series of incredibly popular music synthesizers. So if you have danced to songs from the 1980s, you probably have heard some of these instruments. Chowning's invention became one of Stanford's most profitable patents. It earned Stanford something like $25 million. But the idea originated in the music department, not the computer science department or the biotech department. The music department, not usually the place that we think of in terms of coming up with profitable innovations that are used and experienced by tens of millions of people. But moreover, Chowning's invention became the model that Stanford later used for other fields like biotech and computer science. Now, I love examples like this because they help challenge these preconceptions of technology and innovation. They call into question who does innovation and what an innovator looks like. So when we move away from the shadows that are cast by these traditional ways of understanding innovation, we start to see the complexity of past industrial revolutions in new ways. We notice the stubborn persistence of older technologies. We appreciate the essential role of users and maintainers. We start to notice the intangibles that make technologies more orderly. And these histories show us that industrial revolutions are much more than just stories about innovation and progress. Rather, the technology itself, both the tangible and the ephemeral, was and very much remains a work of progress and a work in progress. Thank you very much. If you have questions or comments, I'm happy to do my best to try to answer them, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Professor. So again, I just want to reiterate, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A. Um, I do have a, a question for you, and it's maybe not specific to the, the content of your presentation, but you mentioned um, one of your classes that you teach at UCSB is the history of technology. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe share some of the other courses that you teach? Sure. Um, I teach on a regular basis two lower division undergraduate classes. So I teach one in the history of modern science. And then because I'm not terribly original, I teach a similar class on the history of modern technology. Um, and you know, I usually teach one of these every, you know, teach them every other year. So next year is technology, and that will be in winter 22. And then for upper division, I teach a whole host of things. I have taught courses on the history of nuclear weapons. I teach a more focused class, which looks at the history of technology in like 20th century of the United States. You know, so again, the survey classes tend to be for um, anywhere from 80 to 160 students, where the upper division classes are usually capped at about 30 students or so. And then every so often I teach even smaller seminars, um, which I believe are listed in our department as R courses, not sure why, but maybe R is for research. Um, and those are usually capped at like 14 students or so. So again, it's a whole array of things, but I have lots of wonderful colleagues here who also teach courses in the history of science. So my colleague, Kate McDonald, teaches stuff on modern Japan and transportation and infrastructure. Uh, Brad Boule teaches a course on the scientific revolution. So if you're interested in people like Galileo and whatever, he's your guy. Uh, my colleague, Yelena Aranova, who grew up in the Soviet Union, teaches a wonderful course on Cold War science. So. I think it's a really amazing class because you get this history of science during the Cold War as taught by somebody who lived both in the Soviet Union, but also um, you know, in the United States. So it's a pretty good array of people. I should also add, we've got a new person joining our department next year. Uh, Taylor Moore is a, a historian who looks at 
magic and the occult and women's history, largely in the context of um, the Middle East and Africa. So that's kind of a different perspective in terms of um, the history of science and technology, but you know, one we're certainly happy to have. Great, thank you. Um, now you mentioned research. Is there much opportunity for undergraduates to get involved in research within history, whether with you or other faculty? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we offer like more formal sorts of things. So we have, um, uh, for people who are history majors, we have a senior honors thesis, which is um, like an all year, you know, sort of intensive research experience. Again, I think that's limited to maybe just 12 or 15 students. If you're interested in uh, public policy, we offer a similar sort of senior thing where you're looking at the history of public policy. So I think for people who might be thinking, you know, hey, this history stuff is cool, but I don't really want to do just that. Maybe I want to take some of what I'm learning and apply it for, you know, thinking about like law or political science or whatever. That's another way of, um, of approaching it. I think one of the things that I find really interesting is from at least for the survey classes I teach, um, I tend to get a lot of students from the sciences and engineering. In fact, I mean, well, in Zoom land, it's a little hard to do, but you know, usually when I teach those classes, it's always like, you know, how many of you are STEM majors? And it's usually about 80%, which is always kind of interesting to me. But I think what I like about that the most is they're oftentimes freshmen, uh, maybe a few sophomores, but it's probably their first humanities class at UCSB. And it's almost always their first history class. So for me, that's always really exciting and something I really enjoy is interacting with students, helping them better understand the histories of science and technology. And, um, you know, I always find them just a you know, delightful group of students to work with. Great, thank you. So again, I want to call, there's no questions so far in the chat or the Q&A. It's so amazing that it's just everything is <laughs> answered for you. I was going to say, maybe it's a testament to how clear and thorough all of that was. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you mentioned that so many of your students um, uh, are actually STEM majors. And if I'm understanding right, I think your background is also in STEM. Is that right? It is. Yeah. So my degrees. So, OK, I'm in the history department. I'm a professor here. But, um, you know, yay for me. But all of my degrees are actually in engineering. So um, all the way through, I uh, did material science, and, uh, material science and engineering. So I was sort of working at that border of solid state physics and chemistry. But somewhere along the way, I wanted to find um, a way to combine my interest in history and the humanities with the fact that I really like science and technology. So the history of science was kind of a way to do that. And one of the things that I think is helpful is at least bringing to my work a sense of some understanding of what it's like to be an engineering or science student and having some sense of like you know what all those equations and what all that math means coupled with um, hopefully some understanding of the history as well. That's great to hear. What, uh, what prompted you to want to bring in the humanities into your science background like was there was there a class or, or something that sparked that interest in making that connection well, uh, my parents were both um high school teachers and my dad taught english so that probably was it um just always liked history um you know i had a pretty rudimentary understanding of it until you know until i went away to, to university um but i think it's just kind of this idea of you know I get bored easily. So I think one of the things is just taking things from new fields and mix them up and whatever. I mean, I recently, you know, wrote a book and it's about um, how engineers and artists work together to make works of art. And again, this was an opportunity to kind of go back to the history of engineering and technology that I knew pretty well, but to combine it with um, my own lack of understanding of art history and to sort of learn a little bit about a new field. So, you know, for five or six years, that was really cool. And something I really enjoyed doing was, um, you know, in essence, learning kind of a new subfield of history. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, we did get a question. Um, a question Any came question? in. <laughs> Can you elaborate more about how the federal government plays a role in funding innovation? Sure. Um, well, you've all seen one of these. 
I could not think of a single thing in this device that cannot trace its origins back to federal funding for science and technology. So the voice recognition, the microprocessors, the touch screen, the charge couple devices that go into the camera, all of that um, can be traced back to funding provided by the federal government in the 1960s and 1970s. So again, if we sort of think about where and how science is done, um, you know, if you, when you're at UCSB, if you're a STEM student, you can ask one of your professors or advisors this, say like, you know, hey, professor advisor, not to put you on the spot, but the money that supports your research, where does that come from? And they'll probably say something like the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health or DARPA or the Department of Energy or, or what have you. Um, that's just sort of the nature of the ways in which research and development in the United States are have been funded since the end of the Second World War. It wasn't always that way. I mean, one of the cool things about history is you get to learn about historical change over time. I mean, that's in essence what history is. It's change or continuity over time. And if you were to go back 100 years ago to the 1920s, most science and technology was funded by private corporations. So AT&T and General Electric and places like that employed huge numbers of physicists and chemists and engineers in large corporate laboratories. A large part of the money also came from philanthropy. So you had people like Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller who started things like Carnegie, uh, the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation, again, to fund uh, science and engineering research. You know, we still have elements of that today. You've got people like Bill Gates, um, who has a lot of money apparently and funds things like research into malaria and stuff like that. But the whole idea is that the funding of research in the United States is done in this very sort of pluralistic kind of fashion. But the federal government um, historically has played a very, very important role in that. I mean, again, we can look at companies like SpaceX and we're all like, you know, yay, SpaceX. And if you're at UCSB, you can actually walk out to the bluffs and see the rocket launches from Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is something that is very cool and I strongly encourage all of you to do. Um, but, you know, SpaceX, private space company, but its biggest customer is NASA. So, you know not exactly private business, kind of private business. I hope that answered the question. All right, any other questions, folks? This is your shot. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, eventually I am, but you know. All right, I'm not seeing anything else come through. Well, I'm going to put my email in the chat here. Let's just do that. If any of you are intrigued by anything that I talked about, or if you want to say, I think what you just told us is a bunch of nonsense and I want to argue with you about it. I've got an email address and I answer email all day long. And if you want to drop me a note, um, um, that would be awesome. Will the session recording be emailed out? That's a good question. That's kind of a, uh, that's a question for you, I think. Yeah, so we'll actually upload the recording um, for this session to our faculty lecture YouTube channel, which I'll go ahead and, and pull that up. We did get another question in the meantime. Oh, um, I'll post a link to that in the chat, but yes, you can expect that this will be up within the week. Um, now, another question came in asking, are there any solutions that people are working on to improve the destruction that we have going on right now? So good Lord, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty broad question. And, you know, I'm a historian, not a improved destruction kind of scientist. Um, but so I'm not exactly sure which, which of the destruction you're talking about, I'm going to guess probably um, environmental. Um, for those of you who are interested in that, one of UCSB's wonderful strengths is environmental studies. Um, you know, as much as I love history, environmental studies, also awesome department with some really great people there. Uh, I would encourage you to strike up some conversations and dialogue um, with the people there. There are lots of, you know, solutions proposed for things like climate change, whatever. 
some of them in the realm of policy, some of them in the realm of encouraging humans to behave differently, um, some in the realm of technology. So things like geoengineering, of course, are ideas that people are um, experimenting with. So if you wanna drop me an email, I can maybe answer that in a little bit more concrete sort of way, or maybe point you to some people who might be able to provide you with answers. Uh, I was impressed by the talk, Food for Thought, Super Fun Sites, and the Tangibility of the Cloud. Thank you, Sam. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, um, I don't know what to say other than, yes, I, I think it is a very good uh, way of, of thinking about that because, I mean, there's a reason they call it Bitcoin mining. You know, they don't call it Bitcoin birthing or Bitcoin creating or whatever. I mean, it's interesting that they've gone back to like this 19th century term to describe how this thing called a Bitcoin or a um, cryptocurrency is created. Um, and these things do have real environmental impacts. I mean, every time you send a tweet or post a picture on Snap Talk, chat, Twitter, whatever, um, there's a little puff of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. That's just the reality of it. Um, you know, these data centers require energy. They don't run on gerbils. So, um, you know, this is something I, you know, we can think about and you can talk about, but there's certainly things that can be measured. But I think more importantly, this idea of images and metaphors um, matters. I mean, again, once you, you call something cloud computing, you've kind of removed a lot of the thinginess from it, if you will. Um, so again, those, those metaphors do do matter. And I'm not trying to bum all of you out and tell you not to post your pictures on Instagram or whatever, but it is important to remember that there is a huge physical infrastructure that consumes lots of resources and lots of energy behind that. And that in places like Silicon Valley, it does leave an environmental legacy behind um, that, you know, for better or for worse has to be cleaned up. Uh, we did get a, a question asking, do you have any recommendations on books or articles about these topics like the Oh, I sure do. Um, I'm going to go into the Google later here and maintainers Aeon. I use that example because that comes from two of my colleagues. I'll put it in the chat here. Where's the chat? There we go. Da, da, da. So check out that article. And the two colleagues of mine who wrote that wrote a book with the subtle title, The Innovation Delusion, um, that has that came out uh, in mid-2020. Great time to have a new book come out because people weren't paying attention to anything else. Um, but anyway, it's a very good book. I highly encourage it. Um, it makes the argument for paying attention to maintenance and reuse and recycling. But it also, as the subtitle suggests, it encourages people also to think about the people that are involved with maintaining what they call systems of care. You know, again, we spent a lot of time thinking about like medical inventions and things like that. But, you know, as we're discovering or have discovered in this last, uh, in the last 14 months, you know, there's, there's this whole category of underpaid, undervalued essential workers, many of whom, um, you know, are important participants in the healthcare system, literally taking care of us, our family members, and the people around us. So maintenance isn't just something that's about technological infrastructure, but it's also something that can be extended to our own personal and social lives. I mean, think about the work that we spend just, you know, maintaining friendships, uh, maintaining social contacts, um, the work that we do that goes into taking care of ourselves, um, something that we've learned very much um, in the last year. Great. So I don't see anything else in the chat or the Q&A. So okay. if that is it, we can wrap up a few minutes early. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. That was wonderful. Again, we'll be uploading the recording this week. Uh, but before we close out, anything you want to add? Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, seriously, feel free to email me. I, I mean that in all seriousness. I am happy to respond to student inquiries. It's part of my job. It's what I get paid to do. Just feel free to drop me a note, OK? Thanks so much. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your night. All right. See y'all. Bye-bye.